Hello everyone, we are the SYDRC community team and today we'll be talking about our project creating a contemporary profile of the Somali community in Camden. But before that, let's get to know the team. My name is Rupsha. I'm Dylan. I'm Spencer. Jackson. The problem that we were trying to address through our project was that policymakers and Somali community-based organizations lack up-to-date information on the Somali community in London. Um, and even if there are statistics or data related to the Somali community, it's often grouped with the BAIM community. And uh, we, have, we have talked a lot to the SYDRC members, and they know that there are problems that exist in the Somali community, but they lack statistics to support it. So for that, the goal for our project was supporting further services for the Somali community, and our objectives were understanding the challenges and accomplishments, collecting new quantitative data, gathering new qualitative data from interviews, and then encapsulating our findings in a report. For collecting quantitative data, we made a survey, a comprehensive survey, uh, which would take about 10 minutes for people to fill in. Uh, it was open for four weeks and we got 342 responses from the community. Um, the, there were questions related to identity, employment, education, and, and now Spencer's gonna explain how uh, the survey was designed. So because we wanted to ask so many questions to cover so many different areas, we ended up filtering uh, the survey into three different surveys based on other responses to other questions to make sure that respondents were only answering questions relevant to them. The way this works is that respondents would first be sent to a data consent form that made sure that we had the right uh, under GDPR to use their data for our research. From there, if they said no, they were kicked out of the survey. But if they said yes, they were sent to a series of screener questions, which made sure that they were an adult Somali living in Camden. Uh, from there, we separated them all by age. If they were in the 16 to 25 year old age range, then they were sent to a youth safety section of the survey. And from youth safety to a youth education section, and from youth education to an employment section. Uh, if they were older than 25, they were sent from the screener questions to educational history. And from educational history, we asked whether or not they had children attending school in Camden. If they said no, they were sent to the housing section directly. If they said yes, then they were asked a few questions about their children's uh, experience in Camden schools before they were sent to housing. From housing, uh, the adults then meet up with the young adults in the employment section. After the employment section, all responses were funneled into the healthcare section and from healthcare into identity before submitting the survey. So for gathering the qualitative data, we did 11 one-on-one -on -one interviews that included SYDRC staff members, Camden Council members, the Director of Equality, um, Camden officers. Uh, we had Somali teachers from Camden schools, a Somali journalist, so social researcher who had written one of the papers that we um, based our project on, and a Somali business owner. Uh, along with, with that, we had four focus groups, <coughs> six Somali young boys, where we had questions regarding youth safety, seven Somali women, where we talked a lot about Somali identity. And then we had two focus groups with seven mothers and seven fathers, where we asked them about their involvement in their kids' education, uh, about passing on Somali culture to their kids, and the strengths and weaknesses of the Somali community. For our preliminary research, there were two benchmark reports that we used, um, or we studied, before coming to London. These reports were the Conan Jones 2003 report and the Open Society Foundation report in 2014. After reading these reports, we separated into four sectors that we wanted to study when coming to London, education, employment, health, and housing. Well being here in London and through our conversations with the people that we have met, we also created two other sectors, youth safety, and 
identity. Here's some background that we had received from the reports. In the Conan Jones 2003, there was found to be a low attainment of higher education. And this is clearly viewed in the graph beneath where undergraduate and postgraduate are very low. Conan Jones reported a 95% unemployment. This can be seen in the picture above as we have one person to 20. Conan Jones also fed, found widespread overcrowding. The graph below shows the average number of people in a household. Um, so as you can see here, the majority of households had four to five people and even more. Um, and they also discussed uh, through interviews and conversations in the community, the problem with overcrowding. Uh, Conan Jones also found that religion was very important in the community. They asked respondents to rate on a scale of one to five the importance of religion and almost all gave it a five. Now, these are just some of the findings we found from the Conan Jones report. Uh, however, when we present our results, we're going to compare a lot of it to current data for the averages in Camden in 2022. Uh, we would use this report more, but the study was very limited. It had only 100 respondents for their surveys. So the data may not be as accurate as we would like. Moving into our data, of the 343 people that responded to our survey, we had an even split of male to female. We only had one uh, more female respondent than we did male respondents. And we had a good distribution across the age groups, although there were lower numbers than we would like to see in the 46 and above groups, about half as many as other age groups, the 16 to 25 and uh, so on. So when looking at the postcodes that were provided from respondents uh, up to the survey, we found that a lot of the respondents live in Camden Town, Kentish Town, uh, the, chalk, the Chalk Farm area, as well as Queens Crescent and Regents Park. And this can be seen by our graph below where red is more dense areas of Somali community population. So uh, discussing the health section of the Conan Jones report, uh, Conan Jones found that when seeking uh, health care, 22% uh, of their respondents listed language to be a barrier. Our new survey found that only 9% of respondents, 9.8% listed language as a barrier. Uh, we can see that in this graph below, uh, we have uh, language being one of the smaller uh, reasons that uh, respondents were discouraged from visiting doctors. Uh, very encouraging to see that the largest bar here is that most respondents were not discouraged from seeing doctors. But the of those who were, the major uh, difficulty they encountered was with scheduling an appointment, which has been a common problem with the United Kingdom National Healthcare Service uh, since the pandemic began in uh, 2020. That said, sometimes language can still be a barrier that has to be overcome. Hanad Muhammad, the director of equalities for Camden Council, told us as much during an interview. Uh, and he said that translation can be a simple way to support uh, communities like the Somali community. Uh, one example that he gave where the government is currently lacking in this is during the coronavirus pandemic when there were public health announcements happening every day from 10 Downing Street. Uh, all of them were in, in English. So the Somali community, many of them not speaking English especially well, might not have been able to uh, get all the information that they needed from those and it became a barrier.
And so while these language barriers can still be reduced, there are overall very positive uh, reports from the healthcare system. So on our survey, we asked how much respondents agree or disagree with the statements like GPs treat me with respect, GPs are easy to reach, and that they give me the good advice and give me resources to help me. And so as you can see from the graph, almost all the responses are uh, either agree or strongly agree. Uh, the one that is being the most negative feedback being GPs are easy to reach. Um, but as Spencer just described, that's an issue all around the United Kingdom, not specific to the Somali community. And so now moving into the housing. Um, most housing is owned by the Canon Council or housing associations. In fact, in total, more than 90% of these survey respondents lived in housing owned by the council or housing association. And more specifically, none of the 343 respondents owned their own house. And now moving into the overcrowding problem indicated earlier from the Connor Jones report. Uh, this is the graph you saw earlier of the number of people living in a home. We asked an analogous question on our survey of the number of people living in their home. And the responses indicated that homes are being more crowded. And so we also asked a question on the number of rooms or the number of bedrooms in a house. So these next graphs show the differences between overcrowding uh, compared to the average in Camden. So the one on the left is single person households. So the Camden average is 63% of households are single uh, person households, meaning only one person lives in that. For the Somali respondents, this number was 5%. So that's, there's a large difference there. And then when you look at multi-person households, uh, this was figured by a household with more than 1.5 people per room. And so 42% of Somali respondents indicated that they were more than 1.5 people per room, whereas the Camden average is only 18%. In our survey, we asked a question about the frequency of housing problems that people had and how, you, how quickly they were resolved. So 30% of respondents um, have housing problems for more than a month, and that's indicated through this graph. Moving into employment, we stated earlier that Khan and Jones had reported 95% of their respondents fell into the same category as unemployment. Uh, our numbers from our survey are much more encouraging than that. Uh, as you can see here, the majority of respondents had some sort of paid employment, whether that be full-time, part-time, or self-employed, and only about 40% were economically inactive, meaning they didn't have a paying job. Uh, but when we break down those economically inactive groups even further, uh, we can see that most of those are students, retired people, uh, people who are medically unable to work or stay at home parents, and only about 7.2% of those who responded to our survey were truly unemployed. Moving into one of the most shocking statistics that we received from our survey, at least 90.6% of respondents are below the median household income in Camden. Looking at the graph here, the first marking is the median household salary in Camden. And you can see that almost all of the respondents are beneath this. But the second marking that we have also put on the graph is the UK poverty line, which has around 35% of respondents beneath, which is really astonishing data. Moving into education, uh, our survey responses indicated that the community uh, who had taken the survey were highly, highly educated. Uh, you can see in this graph of the education of everyone who took the survey that the vast majority had completed primary, secondary, and college. Uh, and not only that, but uh, around 53% had completed their 
undergraduate degree. This is about 17% higher than the Camden average uh, for completion of an undergraduate degree. Uh, or I think actually the UK average as well. When we start to break this down by age, we see even more interesting data come through. Uh, on the left here, you can see the data for those aged 46 and above. You can see that the majority of them completed primary school, secondary school, and college, uh, but they did not complete that inside the UK. This makes sense when you consider that most of this age group would have uh, been in Somali yeah, for their entire childhood uh, and only have come to the UK uh, when the Civil War started uh, in the 1990s. Uh, moving to the right side of the screen, we can see the 26 to 45 have even higher rates of attainment for primary, secondary school and college, uh, and an increasing number of those being completed in the UK. Also note that uh, undergraduate education completion is rather high for the 26 to 45 year olds uh, compared to the 46 and above. This data is even more interesting when we start to look at the 16 to 25 year olds. Uh, now, almost all of those who responded in this age group had completed their primary school, secondary school, and college. Uh, and most of them had completed it in the borough of Camden. Uh, not all of them had completed college, but that makes sense when you consider that these are 16 to 25 year olds and so many of them might still be attending college. Uh, similarly, um, the majority of them had completed an undergraduate degree, which is very impressive considering, again, that many of these are young. Uh, when we start to break down, note also that uh, this graph has some of the lowest rates of apprenticeship and vocational training out of all of the age groups that we've looked at so far. Now, when we start to break down the same data by gender, we can see that there are roughly equal rates of educational attainment for both male respondents and female respondents. Uh, but when we look specifically at the gender breakdown for the 16 to 25 year olds, that is not the case. Uh, of those who we surveyed, only around 30% of the males had completed their uh, undergraduate degree in the 16 to 25 year old age bracket, whereas 81% of the females had. That is a stark contrast, but it agrees with a lot of what we had heard from the Somali community that we interviewed, which is that the young women in this community have been especially forward about uh, their educational attainment and about uh, becoming a, a part of greater London society. And so we also wanted to ask questions about uh, Somali experiences in the Camden schools. And so we asked uh, questions about how much they agree or disagree with uh, the statement shown on the screen. Uh, so this was sent to the parents. And at first we thought that these were fairly positive uh, responses. However, we also looked at the standardized questions. So these questions are from an Ofsted parent survey. And so this is, these are standard questions that are asked every year. And so we looked at the 2022 responses for Camden and there is an overwhelming majority of strongly agree for the Camden average. So uh, around three times as many parents strongly agreed with these statements compared to much less for uh, the Somali respondents. And furthermore, we asked the children, uh, sorry, the uh, youth, whether or not they had teachers that looked like me. And this was the most negative response we got. Uh, most of the responses either strongly disagreed or disagreed that uh, schools have the teachers that look like them. So this suggests that there is a lot of, uh, there's a lack of Somali and black representation in the school. And so from our interviews, this 
was agreed with as well. One teacher said the biggest effect on the Somali students is the parents not understanding the new, the new system. There are not many Somali teachers in schools and the lack of parents understanding the English language to be, actually, to be able to actually clearly understand what the new system means has hindered them. And furthermore, that same teacher expressed that Somali students are viewed negatively in schools and face uh, lower expectations. So one quote was they suffer from the concept of them being African, so black, so automatically these kids aren't seen as bright enough. The teacher explained that oftentimes the uh, other teachers will grade them lower just because of the way they look. And another very powerful quote he said was that it's like starting a race, but the people running your race have run 200 meters already and you're told to go and chase them. And furthermore, Somali respondents also felt less safe in schools. So we asked the parents and the children whether or not they felt safe in the schools. And similar to the previous questions, this was also a standardized Ofsted question. Um, so the one on the top is the parents and the bottom is the Camden average for the parents' responses. And as you can see, uh, similar to before, around three times as many parents for the Camden average felt that their kids were uh, very safe in schools. And moving into youth safety, this was another issue that we found uh, having many conversations around the community and with staff members and such. So in almost all of our interviews, we asked the question, what do you think is the biggest challenge of the Somali community? And an overwhelming majority of the responses had to do with uh, knife crime or youth violence. So we asked the Somali journalist, Abdi Hafid Jama, uh, what his he thought was the, most, the largest challenge, and he responded with knife crime. Similarly, we asked um, Yusuf Diro, the uh, head of SYDRC, and he responded saying, Ken is very much known for this. We've really suffered from youth violence as victims and as suspects. When taking a look at youth responses to the survey, there was a clear divide between West and East regions of Camden where respondents felt safe. We had asked two open-ended questions and these open-ended questions, respondents would put the places in Camden that they felt safe and unsafe. And taking tallies of these totals, we were able to gather unsafe sentiment and safe sentiment. And the circle size is proportional to the number of responses. Here you can see that the right half of the map has much more unsafe sentiment compared to the left half of the map. And this is interesting because it directly lines up in the areas where Somali population is densest, as can be seen from the survey response graph. So this directly, this, this makes sense from another question that we had asked in our survey, because youth respondents have high level of crime in their own neighborhoods. As we can see here, my neighborhood has a high level of crime, has a very strongly agree and agree kind of sentiment towards it, as well as crime has increased in the last three years, it has a very strongly agree and agree sentiment to it. But most still claim that they feel safe in their own neighborhood. And so far, what, a lot of what we've been discussing is uh, youth safety for the boys. Um, however, young women also indicated that they face high levels of Islamophobia. So in our survey, we asked the question, have you ever been the target of crime, harassment, or violence because you are Somali? And then we also asked the same question because you're a Muslim. So male respondents were around equal for both Somali and Muslim with around 38% indicating they had. Uh, for females, it was around 25% for being Somali. However, it was uh, up to 42% for being Muslim. When we break this down even further, looking at only uh, the females aged 16 to 25, the harassment uh, from being Muslim actually jumps all the way to 50%. So this was another topic that we talk a lot about in our focus groups and interviews. In our survey, we asked a question, what do you identify the most with? And they had the options of uh, responding as Brit British, Muslim, or Somali. And uh, as we can see through our responses, in the age bracket 16 to 25, they strongly identified with Muslim first. 
And um, that remains consistent um, in like the age groups of 36 and 45. And for the other age groups, they identify more as Somali. Um, and we learned more about this through our focus groups and interviews where we kind of found out that Islam is passed down as the key element of Somali identity. Uh, from the father's focus groups, uh, they kind of indicated that for parents living in Western countries outside Somalia, they're trying to keep their Islamic faith with the religious status passed to the children and because cultures are constantly evolving. So what they can ensure is passing Islamic faith. And in our mother's focus group, uh, one mother said that her, my kids were born here, so they are already British, and it's not possible to compare a kid born here to a kid born in Somalia. So they're different, but at the same time, what she is doing is she's raising them as Muslim. When examining the language skills of respondents, we asked them to rank their own skills with both Somali and English on a scale from one to seven. We can see here the graph for English speaking ability uh, where uh, the youngest generation ranked themselves all as sevens speaking perfect English. And as the generations get older, English skills decrease until the 56 and above generation who uh, reported that they had around a 3.5 on average. This graph flips however, when we start to examine Somali language skills, where now we have the youngest generation uh, speaking on a five on average, and that number increases as we look at older and older groups until we have the 56 and above who all reported speaking perfect Somali. This is something that we saw in the Conan Jones report too. Religion still remains important to the Somali identity. And uh, <coughs> for ages 16 to 25 um, and 56 and above, I think it indicates that it's most important and the data kind of changes in the other data groups uh, in other age brackets. Um, we looked into another research by Dr. Hoke where he talked to 16 um, Bangladeshi youth, uh, uh, sorry, young girls and boys, and um, they talked about how they had this lack of belongingness in the mainstream British society as well as the culture back in Bangladesh. That was something also indicated in our focus groups where the youth said that they did not feel like they fit in with the mainstream British society or the culture back in Somalia. So there's an identity vacuum that's created and Identifying as Muslim kind of fills up that vacuum, and that's where the British Muslim identity comes from. Looking to the future, this is the last section that we will be talking about. And at the end of our survey, we had asked two open-ended questions, one asking the community what kind of service they'd like, services they'd like to see, as well as any other additional comments. When combining these responses, we had a total of 275 responses. And then we separated it to analyze it in two different ways. One was how um, activities offered currently could be changed. And so this is the graph representing that. As you can see, gender and age specific activities was one of the highest counts that we had had. And this directly aligns with what SYDRC has told us previously in that they wanna broaden their services and their outreach to the rest of the community. And that seems to be supported by the responses here. In addition to that, there was a request for more youth activities to be offered, like a, a broader variety of youth activities to be offered, as well as raising awareness and making activities affordable. The second one, or the second way that we analyzed the data was to separate them into common themes of activities that would, would uh, the community wants to be offered. And so at the top of the list, there is community building activities. And this is because there was a strong desire for a more visible community in Camden. In addition to this, 
there were, was also a lot of cultural activities that was requested to be offered, such as Somali cultural and language classes, as well as culturally appropriate services, more specifically, uh, women's only gyms and other culturally appropriate services for women. That's all we have for you today. Thank you so much. We would like to thank our sponsors, Abdi, Muna, Yusuf, and the entire SYDRC team, and our advisors, Dominic Golding and Lorraine, and a special thanks to Naomi, who helped us make our service.